Next Chapter Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of the Play On podcast series at Next Chapter Podcasts. Every person who contributes to the Play On podcast series is essential to the process in some capacity. Translation gives the stories an immediacy that an audio creation needs in order to bring the images that we can't see to life in the mind's eye. Actors breathe life into Shakespeare's unique characters in ways that only the most imaginative performers can convey through their voices. Sound designers create worlds for the episodes to exist in our ears and thoughts. And there are those of us who are far more deeply embedded behind the scenes. The director who works with the actors and the sound designer to specify and enhance each performance and episode. The audio engineers who manage the recording process and edit the dialogue to make it crisp and clean. The coordinating producers who manage the scheduling and script supervision, among a million other things. And then there is the adapter. It's safe to say that the writers who adapt our texts for audio production are the least visible artists in the process, but the most essential to the successful creation of each episode. It's the adapter who has the singular challenge of collating all the information contained in the translated text with the concept, period, and location of each story as envisioned by the director, breaking up that text into an episodic structure, and writing sound cues to provide a roadmap for the sound designer, editor, actors, and director to follow throughout the entire process, from rehearsal to publication, the script adapter has to be a very smart, versatile, creative, and productive person with great ingenuity and a keen sense of how to make the audio medium exciting and captivating for our listeners. Fortunately, we found just that person in Nat Cassidy. Nat writes horror for the page, stage, and screen. His critically acclaimed award-winning horror plays have been produced across the United States, as well as off and off-off Broadway. He won the New York Innovative Theater Award for his one-man show about H.P. Lovecraft and was commissioned by the Kennedy Center to write the libretto for a short opera about the end of the world, naturally. He's an established actor on stage and television, usually playing monsters and villains on shows such as Blue Bloods, Bull, Quantico, FBI, Law & Order, SVU. Nat also authored the novelization of the hit podcast, Steal the Stars, which was published by Tor Books and named one of the best books of 2017 by NPR. His horror novel debut, titled Mary, an Awakening of Terror was published on July 19th, 2022, with a second original horror novel on the way in 2023. Nat is here with us to talk about his contributions to the Play on Podcast series, Measure for Measure. Nat, welcome. It's great Thank to have you. you with us. It's so great <laughs> to be here. Thank you for that incredible intro. I feel so, I feel so special and accomplished now. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, if you ever are down on yourself and you're not feeling productive, just go back and listen to the introduction of this interview and you'll feel so much better. <laughs> I've you know, bookmarked it. That's right. It's it's kind of our self-help, like, you know, resource for <laughs> artists who are feeling <laughs> insecure. So I, I want to go back to you and I know each other. We've known each other for a long, long time. Um, and we've we've worked together as actors. We have uh, you you were you worked with my wife. Uh, oh gosh, as long ago as my son is old, yeah, <laughs> about thirteen, fourteen yeah. years, right? <laughs> and in a recent conversation that you and I had, we talked about um, kids, school, uh, and you know, acting out and being kind of uh, you know hard to control and. You relate a personal anecdote that I I would love for you to share because I think it has it's got so much to do with sort of 
your inception as an artist and as a writer. <laughs> Can you tell us tell us about yourself as a child? That's, I think I know the anecdote to which you are referring. Um, yeah, I was a uh, real pain in the ass kid. I was uh, incredibly hyperactive. I was uh, too smart for my own good, which sounds like it's uh, uh, immodest, but mainly I mean that as a, a diagnosis of like I was. I was just such a smart ass, and I was so bored in class. And my uh, my older brother actually uh, had similar issues, and so he was skipped a grade. Uh, but then that wound up being really difficult for him adjusting to skipping a grade. So my mom specifically made the the decision to not do that for me. So it was just like I was really just frustrated and antsy. And uh, in uh, first grade, I had a teacher who despised me because of all these reasons. Uh, her name was Mrs. Shapiro. Uh, and she was this uh, this little old lady with like a blue beehive. She was very like perfectly cast as like a as a as a task masking uh, master teacher. Uh, and she uh, she was my first of many teachers uh, who uh, had to come up with different ways to discipline me uh, from basically like first to sixth grade. Uh, and, uh, none of those teachers allowed me to have like my own desk. I would have to sit at the teacher's desk and not have a place where I could like, you know, light fires in the back of the classroom or, or carve curse words into the, into the, uh, uh school property. Uh, but she did make one breakthrough, uh, with me that planted a seed that was very important to, as you said, to my, to my artistic temperament and my, uh, my, uh, my life basically, uh, that I, I begrudgingly have to give Mrs. Shapiro credit for. She was giving a slide presentation at one point, um, and I don't know why. When I when I've told this story uh, uh, in later years, I'm I'm often like, what a weird choice this was for her. But she was giving the slide presentation to this first first grade class, uh, and it was of her recent trip to Greece. She was Greek, uh, and she would go back very uh, very frequently. And uh, she's flipping through sides, flipping through sides. And she got to this uh, uh, amphitheater where she had seen a production of Macbeth uh, and for whatever reason, started describing the story of Macbeth to these like six or seven year olds. Uh, and she noticed that I uh, stopped whatever horrible thing I was doing and like kind of perked up. As she described witches and regicide and murder uh, and madness. And after that slide presentation, she uh, basically uh, told me that she noticed that I was really interested, wanted to know if I wanted to know more about Macbeth. And I was like, yeah, that sounds actually kind of cool. Uh, and she dared me uh, if I thought I was such hot shit, uh, she might have phrased it differently, but uh, she dared me to read Macbeth as a first grader. Uh, and I, thinking I was hot shit, was very much like, yeah, I'll do it, Mrs. Shapiro. Uh, and it became the rest of the year's project for me to uh, to sit down with with the original text of Macbeth and read it and, you know, try and figure it out as a tiny child. Uh and my mom helped where she could. She wasn't very familiar uh, with it, but, uh, uh, you know, she kind of uh, helped me out when I was uh, super confused and, and got me some books to also like kind of supplement the reading. Um, and I was already by that point a little precocious child actor, too. I'd been I'd been acting for a whole year by that point at the ripe old age of five. Uh, uh, I had been wanting to get into uh, uh, like regional theater and stuff like that. Uh, and, uh, so I was hooked. I was immediately hooked. It took me the whole year or semester or however, however long it was. Time was very plastic at that age. Uh, uh, but it, it, uh, it took like all of time to read it. Uh, and I wanted to read the next thing and I wanted to read the next thing by Shakespeare and the next thing by Shakespeare. And I had this, uh, uh, copy, we got it from Costco, which at the time was called Price Club. Uh, but it was one of their like bargain books of the complete works of Shakespeare. Uh, and it had, I I think they were like Gustave Doré uh, uh, pictures, or they might've been another artist, but you know, that kind of like woodcut sort of uh, engraving sort of feeling in between each uh, play. And so I picked what play I wanted to read next based off of these pictures. Uh, the next one after Macbeth was uh, Timon of Athens. Because uh, the picture was like, uh, you know, it kind of looked 
similar to Macbeth. It was like this like gnarly old man in the middle of the woods or something like that. I was very disappointed in that one. It did not have the murder and mayhem that I was expecting. But then I quickly moved on to to Lear and to Midsummer, which was a, a huge, uh, huge favorite of mine. Uh, a couple of years later, it was actually like my first big uh, production as an actor. I was I was one of the fairies in Midsummer Night's Dream, and that kind of kickstarted a a lifelong uh, uh, tenure in Midsummer, which I've done like five times at this point or something like that. Uh, and uh, you know, so I basically, and then I moved on to like the Tempest. Any uh, image that looked like it had some sort of supernatural occurrence in it, I was immediately uh, hooked into. And uh, yeah, like that just kind of started a lifelong obsession with Shakespeare. My two biggest literary influences as a as a human being and also as a, as a writer myself uh, have always been Shakespeare and then Stephen King, who I got into uh, probably around nine. Uh, and also just uh, you probably can't read the titles, but this, this is all either like horror or uh, uh, or or like nonfiction is over there. It's horror and or that, nonfiction. And that big bookshelf behind you with yeah. the skull on it, which is always there. And it looks like there back behind you, there's a very scary looking puppet clown type figure. Good old uh, 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 friend to the end, Chucky. Uh, <laughs> Chucky. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like horror, horror and Shakespeare are like just my two things. This, this shelf like directly behind me is almost entirely Stephen King. I'm a Stephen King obsessive and a Shakespeare obsessive. Uh, and as you can see, like they were, they kind of were initial, uh, uh, inceptions that are, that are very, you know, double helix, uh, entwined in a way. Like I loved Shakespeare because of the horror. I love Stephen King because of, I think his, uh, his very, uh, uh, undervalued kind of literary, uh, uh, value. Uh, um, so yeah, they're, they're very, they're very inter intertwined, I think. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's. So uh, so Shakespeare became like a disciplinary measure that wound up setting me on a path and for better or worse. I'm it was your punishment. Down. You're What's still that? living out. Your, you're yeah. still living out your punishment. You won, Mrs. Shapiro. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I can safely say that you're the only person I've ever met who read the complete works of Shakespeare before he was 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I before you get too impressed, I probably understood about 10 percent of it. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with the creatives behind the scenes. To listen to the full interview, join the Play On supporting cast for just $5 a month, which by the time you hear this might be less than you'll pay for a gallon of gas. You'll get in-depth interviews featuring some of the most brilliant artists working today. You'll also enjoy ad-free episodes of the Play On podcast series. Subscribe today for five dollars a month join the cast go to ncpodcast.com and sign up today thanks for listening next chapter podcasts